Hey guys, it's Marta. Today we have a beautiful day here in Poland. You can probably hear the birds behind me. Today I wanted to talk to you about pruning climbing roses. I have a few in my garden and I wanted to show you how I do it. one of our first videos where I showed you my garden through the year uh, you probably noticed that our garden is divided into rooms I'm using uh, this kind of st uh, wooden structures and I have climbing roses on them and this is the first rose I wanted to show you it's a giant rumbler this rose is really huge it's only one rose it's called Bobby James it produces masses of white flowers with beautiful scent. When this rose blooms, the amount of bees and other pollinators that uh, visit it is really mind-blowing. It looks beautiful. The, it has like so many clusters of white, uh, white flowers, but it only blooms once. Uh, but still, the show is such an amazing show that I think it's worth growing. Uh, I also have a lot of clematis here. So uh, after the rose stops blooming, then we have like a few huge flush of clematis blooms. I have a lot of clematis viticella here because I know it's really reliable one. And we have a few, but Prince Charles and Selena are the main ones that bloom here. And it looks really great. But uh, when I talk about pruning this rose, uh, you should prune it in summer after it stops blooming. This is the best uh, time for it. And then in spring, I just look for dead, diseased or damaged uh, stems and I cut them off. Sometimes when I have uh, like a long stem and there were uh, the rose hips, I just prune it back to the first leaf that I see because this part is usually dead. So very light pruning, like a, a bit of dead heading and nothing more. Then when I have stems that are reaching too far, uh, I'm trying to put them on the structure using the elastic bands. After this light prune, I fertilize my rows uh, and I'm using the slow release fertilizer. This is a huge one. You can see that the stems are starting from this point. And as you can see, the rose goes there. And I think it's about three to maybe even four meters. The stems are really, really long. In spring, so uh, late March, early April, I'm fertilizing it with slow, slow release fertilizer and then I mulch with compost. And that's uh, uh, almost all I do. But I wanted to talk to you about how I trained this rose so it uh, blooms that well. Uh, when I started with roses, uh, the climbing roses were a true mystery to me, but uh, then I started researching and I found few rules that I follow for climbing roses that work so well for a lot of blooms and the main rule that I use is uh, when you have the main stems you have to train them the the more horizontally you can do it the better so uh, when it starts growing and if you'd let it grow up you would only have flowers on the top but then if you try to train it like I did here as you can see the main stems are trained horizontally but then you have the lateral growth, the one that, that blooms. And if you train it horizontally, all of the buds will be uh, activated and they will grow into the lateral growth. And then on those you will have a lot of flowers. So I try to do that with all my climbing roses. The main stems, you cannot always go like to totally horizontally, but uh, you can train them going like this and then like this or at least 45 degrees. And then it, it gives you great uh, results. So this one, this giant rambler is Bobby James, but another one that I have in my garden, it's called a medium rambler and it's called Super Dorothy, but I think that the name is really good because this rambler grows like crazy. We have it on a structure that we uh, store our garbage in and it covers it completely. So uh, with this one, I also just do a light prune uh, of dead stems, diseased stems uh, in uh, spring. But in summer, when it finishes blooming, I just do uh, some of the shearing of the, 
a lot of those stems that it produces. It really tries to take over uh, another part of the garden. So rumblers are meant for places that have a lot of uh, room in and you have to be very careful not to put it in a place when you want it contained, really give it a lot of space. So this is my super Dorothy. It looks like a lot of mess now, but uh, in summer, it's like, uh, it's such an eye catcher. You can see it from the garden. You can see it when you pass our, our home uh, going through the street. So I know a lot of people just stop and look at it because it looks like a giant uh, pink bowl of flowers. Uh, here I will be doing just some light pruning of the owl. <laughs> owl. <laughs> here I'll be doing a uh, light prune of the dead stems. Some of them, especially below all, all of that canopy of, I don't know, the mangled mess uh, will need to be removed, but I need to wear some, some gloves because uh, this rose is incredibly prickly. Next up, I wanted to show you my constant spray. So here on the pergola I have two constant spray roses, one of the most famous ones from David Austin. Uh, when I was uh, thinking about this part of the garden, my uh, inspiration was the book uh, The Secret Garden. It was uh, one of my favorite books when I was a little girl. I used to read it, I used to dream about Robin visiting my garden, having roses, having something that looks really magical. So I designed this part of the garden to be really full, full of flowers and a, a very romantic part of of the garden and constant spray is one of the main uh, impacts. I could sit around and wait all day. You lay easy on my So on this pergola I have two constant spray roses. One is here, the other one is here. They are really big roses, so have that in mind if you uh, are planning to put it in your garden. Uh, because constant spray only blooms once, uh, I also decided to put clematis here. We have beautiful purple ones like Polish Spirit, Etoile Violet, uh, and another one which I cannot remember now. But uh, in the other part of the year, the clematis are putting on the show. But in late June, early, late June, I would say, late June, uh, we have a lot of flowers from Constant Spray, which are beautiful pink, beautifully scented. And the, here with the Alchemilla Mollis uh, and uh, the Nepeta, the, the show is really, really beautiful. I cannot wait for this year's show. So it is advised that constant spray should be pruned uh, in late summer, but I do it in early spring and I get a lot of bloom, so I stay with that method. When it was young, I tried training the stems, which are very stiff and you should have that in mind. So you should start as early as possible when they are more bendy. So some stems, I let them grow up and then I try to bend them on the pergola, but some of them I'm bending to try to go around the pergola. If I have uh, the horizontal growth from the main stand, then the lateral growth will be more abundant and will get uh, more flowers on the lower part of the plant. The older Constance gets, it gets more and more lateral growth and then I prune it in spring. So I try to prune it back pretty hard. Uh, I cut above or prune above the first, second or third node, depending on how it looks like, how healthy the stem looks like. And I get a lot of short ones. Uh, this makes the flower bloom uh, pretty close to the pergola and I think it looks better. And we still can get some more branching, which is always encouraging for the blooms, more blooms to come. Here I have pruned the lateral growth uh, above the third node or fourth node and I'm trying to make a big bowl of flowers here also on the lower part of the rose. Below the rose uh, here is Alcamilla Mollis, one of the best perennials in my garden. This place is where it loves to grow. I had it in another border, it didn't like it. Here it is very happy so it gets a lot of sun, but I would say seven to eight hours of sun. Uh, the soil is really, really moist and 
we really need to cut it back to go through this uh, through this path to the cut flower garden and it's one of the best perennials and I think it looks great with the rose and then we have a lot of nepeta so we get a lot of purple flowers blooms and it really works nice works nicely together Another part of our garden that has a lot of climbing roses is our wooden wall of roses and clematis. I could sit around and wait all day You lay easy on my mind Like a candle I just burn away really have... So here you can see the same concept of uh, training the main stems as horizontally as you can so, so I'm trying to bend them of course you cannot always do it like this but I'm trying to bend them so it's like 45 degrees uh, angle and then all of the buds will grow as the lateral growth and if you have uh, some lateral growth I will prune it back after the second or third node uh, about I would say five to seven centimeters from the main uh, stem and then we'll get a lot of flowers hopefully this year. In our country sometimes climbing roses can be difficult because we get a lot of frost during uh, uh, winter so sometimes we have some frost damage and climbing roses are most prone to that so I'm trying gr to grow ones that are resistant to that but then it, it shows me that each year is different. If we have a drier year more harsh winter uh, the rose can uh, can be just damaged that much that we need to wait for new stems to come. So sometimes it's really challenging and sometimes I cannot uh, think of the reason that could, what happened to this rose. The, the, the year was fine, everything was good, but then the stem dies on us. So it just happens. But this year hopefully we'll have some uh, a good year. I lost a few good stems on my jasmine. It's a beautiful pink rose with very specific scent, but uh, a really healthy one. And I think it was a mole uh, that did some damage to uh, to her uh, to her roots. And I think that that was it. And then the winter kicked in and both of those things killed her. So here I planted a new jasmine rose and I hope her stems will grow fast and I will have again the same beautiful show that we had with the old one. Sometimes it happens, sometimes you will lose a rose, you will lose a plant and it's a part of being a gardener. Okay, I hope that rose pruning advice was useful. Uh, I also wanted to show you my hellebores. A lot of bulbs, perennials, everything is emerging from the, uh, from the soil. And I just love it. We start in March, we have black soil and then everything is popping. Everything is getting greener and greener and fuller every week. And then we get the show of all of the flowers blooming. I cannot wait. But the hellebores now are the main stars of the show. I wanted to show you my hellebores. They are one of my favorite plants because they bloom in winter and when everything is very bare in the garden, they always give me so much joy with their flowers. But now uh, at the end of March and in April, at the beginning of April, they are putting on quite a show, really. Uh, I cut all of the flowers from last year so you can see the blooms better and also it like, helps them with uh, disease resistance. But no words, you just have to look at them. And the bees love them too. This hellebore is called Brunello and it's from a series called Ice and Roses and I think it's the best series of hellebores I have encountered because it blooms, uh, it's some, some of them start blooming in uh, November, at the end of November, and they are sp still blooming till this day. Uh, they didn't care if we had minus 15 degrees uh, Celsius this year. They also bloomed. Uh, none of the flowers were damaged. So the Ice and Roses series is, I think, a really reliable one. So the one I can highly recommend. Okay guys, it was great to see you this week. Uh, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, let us know in the comments uh, if you have climbing roses and if you have halibors, do you have favorite ones? And please consider subscribing and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.